Ladies and gentlemen, I, I appear before you today for the purpose of discussing the leading political topics which now agitate the public mind. By an arrangement between Mr. Lincoln and myself, we are present here today for the purpose of having a joint discussion as the representatives of the two great political parties of the state and union. Upon the principles and issues between those parties and this vast concourse of people shows the deep feeling which pervades the public mind in regard to the questions dividing us. Prior to 1854, this country was divided into two great political parties, known as the Whig and Democratic parties, which were national and patriotic, advocating principles that were universal in their application. An old line Whig could proclaim his principles in Louisiana and Massachusetts alike. Whig principles had no boundary sectional line. They were not limited by the Ohio River nor the Potomac, nor by the line of the free and slave states, but applied and were proclaimed wherever the Constitution ruled or the American flag waved over the American soil. So it was, and so it was. It is with the great Democratic Party, which from the days of Jefferson until this period has proven itself to be the historic party of this nation. While the Whig and Democratic parties differed in regard to the bank, the tariff, the dis distribution, and the specie circular and the sub-treasury, they agreed on this great slavery question, which now agitates the Union. I say that the Whig party and the Democratic party agreed on this slavery question, while they differed on those matters of expediency to which I have referred. In 1854, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Abraham Lincoln and Mr. Trumbell entered into an arrangement one with the other, and each with his respective friends, to dissolve the old Whig party on the one hand and to dissolve the old Democratic party on the other, and to connect the members of both into an abolition party under the same name and disguise of the Republican party. I have the resolutions of their state convention then held, which was the first mass state convention ever held in Illinois by the Black Republican Party. And, and I now hold them in my hands and will read a part from, of them. Here are the most important and material resolutions of this abolition platform. One, resolved that we believe this truth to be self-evident and that when parties become sub subversive of the ends for which they establish or are incapable of restoring the government to the true principles of this constitution, it is the right and duty of the people to dissolve the political bands by which they have been connected therewith and to organize new parties upon such principles and with such views as the circumstances and exigencies of the nations may demand. Number two, resolved that the times imperatively demand the reorganization of parties and repudiating all previous party attachments, names and predilections. We unite ourselves together in defense of the liberty and constitution of the country and will and we and will hereafter cooperate as the Republican Party pledge to the accomplishment of the following purposes purposes to bring the administration of the government back to the control of the first principles, to restore Nebraska and Kansas to the position of free territories, that as the Constitution of the United States vests in the state and not in the Congress, the power to legislate for the extradition of fugitives from labor, to repeal and entirely abrogate the fugitive slave law, to restrict slavery to those states in which it exists, to prohibit the admission of any more slave states into the Union, and to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, to exclude slavery from all the territories over which the general government has exclusive jurisdiction and to resist the acquirement of any more territories unless the practice of slavery therein forever shall, be, shall have been prohibited. Number three, resolved that in furtherance of these principles we will use such constitutional and lawful means as shall seem best adapted to their accomplishment and that we will support no man for office under the general or state government who is not positively and fully committed to the support of these principles, and whose personal character and conduct is not a guarantee that he is reliable and who shall have the abjured old party allegiance and ties. Now gentlemen, your black Republicans have cheered every one of these propositions, and yet I venture to, the, to that you cannot get Mr. Lincoln to come out and say that he is now in favor in each of them, that these propositions and all constitute the platform of the black Republican party of this day. I have no doubt and when you are not aware for what purposes I was reading them, your black Republicans cheer them as good black Republican doctrines. My object is in reading these solutions was to put the question to Abraham Lincoln this day, whether he now stands and will stand by each article in that creed and carry it out. I desire to know whether Mr. Lincoln today stands as he did in 1854, in favor of the unconditional repeal of the fugitive slave law. I desire him to answer whether he stands to pledge today as he did in 1854, against the admission of any more slave states into the Union, even if the people want them. I want to know whether he stands pledged against the admission of a new state into the Union with such a constitution as the people of this st that state may see, may see fit to make. 
I want to know whether he stands today pledged to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. I desire him to answer whether he stands pledged to the prohibition of the slave trade between the different states. I desire to know whether he stands pledged to prohibit slavery in all territories of the United States, north as well as south of the Missouri Compromise Line. I desire him to answer whether he is opposed to the acquisition of any more territory unless slavery is prohibited, prohibited therein. I want, to, I want his answer to these questions, your affirmative cheers in favor of this abolition platform is not satisfactory. I ask Abraham Lincoln to answer these questions in order that when I trot him down to Lower Egypt, I may put the same questions to him. My fellow citizens, when a man hears himself somewhat misrepresented, it provokes him at least. I find it so with myself, but when misrepresentation becomes very gross and palpable, it is more apt to amuse him. The first thing I see fit to notice is the fact that Ju Judge Doug Douglas alleges, after running through the history of the old Democratic and the old Whig parties, that Judge Trumbull and myself made an arrangement in 1854 by which I was to have the place of General Shields in the United States Senate and Judge Trumbull was to have the place of Judge Douglas. Now, all I have to say upon that subject is that I think no man, not even Judge Douglas, can prove it because it is not true. I have no doubts he is conscientious in saying it. As to those resolutions that he took such a length of time to read as being the platform of the Republican Party in 1854, I say I never had anything to do with them. And I think Trumbull never had. Judge Douglas cannot show that either of us ever did have anything to do with them. I believe this is, the tr is true about those resolutions. There was a call for a convention to form a Republican Party at Springfield, and I think that my friend, Mr. Lovejoy, who was here upon this stand, had a hand in it. I think this is true, and I think that if he will remember accurately, he will be able to recollect that he tried to get me into it, and I would not go in. I believe it is also true that I went away from Springfield when the convention was in session to attend court in Tazewell County. It is true they did place my name through, though without authority, upon the committee and afterward wrote me to attend the meeting of the committee, but I refused to do so and I never had anything to do with that organization. That is the plain truth about the whole matter. Now, about this story that Judge Douglas tells of Trumbull bargaining to sell out the old Democratic Party and Lincoln agreeing to sell out the old Whig Party. I have the means of knowing about that. Judge Douglas cannot have. And I know there is no substance to it whatever. Yet I have no doubt he is conscientious about it. I know that after Mr. Lovejoy got into the legislature that winter, he complained of me that I had told all the old Whigs of his district that the old Whig party was good enough for them. And some of them voted against him because I told them so. Now I have no means of totally disproving such charges as this which a judge makes. A man cannot prove a negative, but he has a right to claim when a man makes an affirmative charge, he must offer some proof to show the truth of what he says. I certainly cannot introduce testimony to show the negative about things, but I have the right to claim that if a man says he knows a thing, then he must show how he knows it. I have always a right to claim this, and it is not satisfactory to me that he may be conscientious on the subject matter. Now, gentlemen, I hate to waste my time on such things, but in regard to the, that general abolition tilt that Judge Douglas makes when he says that I was engaged at the time in selling out and abolitionizing the Old League Party, I hope you will permit me to read a part of that printed speech that I made then at Peoria, which will show altogether a different view on the position I took in that contest of 1854. This is the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. The foregoing history may not precisely accurate in every particular, but I am sure it is sufficiently so far all the uses I shall attempt to make of it, and in it we have before us the chief materials enabling us to correctly judge whether the repeal of the Missouri Compromise is right or wrong. I think and shall try to show that it is wrong and in its direct effect letting slavery into Kansas and Nebraska wrong in its pre pr prospective principles allowing it to spread to every other part of the wide world where men can be formed inclined to take it. This declared indifference, but as I must think covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrite causes, the real friends of freedom, to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many real good men amongst ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty, criticizing the Declaration of Independence and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. Before proceeding, let me say, I think I have no prejudice against the Southern people. 
They are just what we would be in their situation. If slavery did not exist among them, they would not introduce it. If it did now exist among us, we should not instantaneously give it up. But this, I believe, the masses of North and South. Doubtless, there are individuals on both sides who would not hold slaves under any circumstances, and others who would gladly introduce slavery anew. If it were out of existence, we know that some Southerners' men do free their slaves, go North and become up-top abolitionists, while some Northerners go South and become most cruel slave masters. But all this, to my judgment, furnishes no more excuses for permitting slavery to go on into our free territory than it would be for reviving the African slave trade by law, the law which forbids the bringing of African slaves from Africa and what which has so long forbidden the taking of them to Nebraska can hardly be distinguished on any moral principle and repeal the former could quite as plausible excuse as that of the latter.